Well, welcome back, everyone, to the Social Contract uh, Research Network seminar. Uh, it is my great delight uh, to present our, our speaker for today, Professor uh, Ioannis Evigenis, uh, Professor of Political Science uh, and Professor of Classical Studies at Tufts University. Uh, it's a particular pleasure because uh, one of his books that I'm going to mention in a moment has been um, pathbreaking and crucial for me. Uh, in my own work on the social uh, contract. So I'm particularly uh, delighted to be able to, to hear from him uh, today. Um, uh, Professor Evigenis teaches courses on ancient and early modern political thought, uh, the social contract and ethics and international relations, uh, as well as seminars on Plato, Machiavelli, Hobbes, uh, oh. and political theory methods. Uh, he's the author of numerous articles on a wide range of topics in political theory, and uh, notably for this seminar, uh, he's the author of the, the wonderful book, Images of Anarchy, uh, The Rhetoric and Science in Hobbes' State of Nature, uh, which came out with Cambridge in 2014. Uh, and his title for today is The Rhetoric of Science and the Science of Rhetoric in Hobbes' State of Nature. So please join with me in welcoming Professor Ioannis Evigenis. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Chris, for the invitation. Um, I'm uh, happy to be returning to the state of nature, so to speak. Um, so the uh, plan is roughly as follows. Um, what I'd like to do is say a little bit about why the state of nature matters, uh, in particular, why it matters for Hobbes. And then um, go through a series of interpretative problems, and those are both general with regard to Hobbes' political theory and specific to the state of nature. Um, I want to then turn to uh, consideration of the meaning of rhetoric, um, both as it's understood by commentators, but more importantly, as it's understood by Hobbes, and then um, return to the state of nature by way of uh, a consideration of the difference between the sumum bonum, uh, the, the notion that there is a highest good, which Hobbes notoriously takes on in chapter 11 of Leviathan, uh, and the sumum malum, which is the uh, alternative that he proposes, and then think about how that relates to the concept of the state of nature. Uh, I should say, please stop me at any point if I'm not making sense or uh, if you have any questions or, or comments. Um, so, why does the state of nature matter? Um, first and foremost, it matters because um, Hobbes takes a concept that had existed for a long time uh, in different names uh, and serving different purposes. Um, it had played a major role in uh, Christian theological writings. Uh, it had played a major role in one way or another in Greek and Roman political thought, um, and of course, Greek poetry uh, and other forms of uh, literature in both Greece and Rome. Um, and by taking it and doing what he did with it, he gave it uh, a new life. And that on its own might seem like a, an interesting literary or historical phenomenon. Uh, the reason why it matters uh, more broadly is because that concept uh, with its particular Hobbesian twist um, becomes an inescapable point of reference for political theorists from Hobbes onwards. And um, here one needs to only mention such names as Locke, Rousseau, Kant, Hegel, uh, Montesquieu, um, all the way to the, the late 20th century and the theorists of distributive justice, so Rawls, Nozick, um, and of course, the theorists of international relations who have taken this concept, which uh, Hobbes addresses in a, as an international relations phenomenon in a handful of lines, and yet it has become the go-to phrase uh, and concept for describing the international system or the absence of an international system. And so it matters because uh, it has become such a widespread uh, concept and tool, um, but also because the fact that it has become such a widespread concept and tool um, is very strange. Uh, 
And it's very strange because um, there, the history of the concept shows a lot of disagreement and uncertainty about what it means. Um, but also because strangely uh, or interestingly, the people who take the concept and use it in the same fashion that Hobbes does uh, disagree with Hobbes about pretty much everything. They nevertheless accept the premise that there was a state of nature and disagree about whether or not Hobbes gave it the right description. Right. So to me, there's no better sign of the significance and impact of a concept than this sort of acceptance. Uh, so that Locke and Rousseau, for example, to take the most obvious examples, um, accept the notion that the state of nature exists and take issue rather with the way in which Hobbes describes it and say, it's not that it doesn't exist, but it's that Hobbes didn't describe it properly. I will give you the right description. Um, now, its primary function uh, in Hobbes, uh, even though it plays many parts, its primary function is to provide uh, the opposite to the state of civil society in the most simple terms. And this is this is a dichotomy that I'm going to challenge many times, but in the most simple terms, its function is to provide an alternative to the state of civil society, whatever that means. Now, um, it's important to remember that Hobbes wrote three political treatises in a total of six versions. Um, and I'm leaving out here minor revisions and so on. Uh, what are these works? The uh, first political treatise is The Elements of Law, uh, written around 1640, circulated in manuscript form among friends and acquaintances. Um, two years later, uh, he circulates, uh, rather than publishes, a version of De Kiwe, uh, which this time was printed, but privately circulated. So very few copies circulate. Nevertheless, it causes such a stir that for years, people are trying to get him to publish a version of De Kiwe. Five years later, he obliges. And one of the um, important changes between the 1642 version and the 1647 version is that the 1647 version contains notes in which he addresses what appear to be objections raised by readers in the meantime. This is a very important fact. I'll return to it in a bit. Four years later comes the English Leviathan. Uh, in 1668, a Latin version of Leviathan is published with some differences, some changes. And then uh, there's Behemoth, the history of the English Civil War, uh, which contains some relevant passages. Now, for our purposes, the state of nature and uh, allusions to things like the state of nature are not confined to the political works. But if we just stayed with the political works, what we see is the evolution of Hobbes's political theory. And that raises very interesting questions for interpreters. Um, so if you stay with uh, the, the basic schools of interpretation, you might ask such, such questions as, uh, is he being consistent? Is there a theory or are there many theories? Is he really uh, responding to specific um, provocations, let's say, from his contemporaries or events that are unfolding before his eyes that are causing him to change what he believes? Um, I'm going to give a, a basic answer from my perspective for now, and that is that he is largely consistent. And why is he largely consistent? Because he never changes his mind about his goal, which is peace as opposed to disorder, let's call it anarchy. Um, the particulars change, the presentation changes. On its face, uh, if you put Leviathan, the Kiwi, and the elements of law side by side, you're going to see that there are lots and lots of changes. If you open the tables of contents, you're going to see lots of changes. Uh, and then there are changes within even chapters that uh, purport to be dealing with the same topic. And so there's no question that there are changes. But for me, the basic issue is, is he being consistent as he presents these different versions of his theory? And as I mentioned, uh, for me, the answer is yes. This begins with um, his very first publication, which is his edition of Thucydides, 
um, one of two works that he was the first to uh, translate from Greek directly into English, the other being uh, a precis of Aristotle's rhetoric. Um, this is another important fact to which I will return. So the uh, corpus that we are presented with from 1629 when the Thucydides edition comes out all the way to the very end of his life uh, shows that his aim was and remains consistent. This was true before the English Civil War. It is true during the English Civil War, and it is true after the English Civil War. Uh, when, for example, he describes the uh, events that unfolded in England during the Civil War in Behemoth, uh, it is very clear that he sees it through that lens. And at the very end of his life, um, having written no fewer than three autobiographical works, um, he makes it very clear that this was his consistent concern from the beginning. And so if you wanted to run a consistency, a basic consistency check, you could take um, his vita and you could take his uh, commentary on his edition of Thucydides and you will see there that the things that he says are the same. Uh, and therefore those who dismiss the autobiographical works of his late 80s as self-serving and sort of presenting a consistent picture, um, the the evidence does not accord with that that reading. He actually is consistent. He was saying the same things um, in the late 20s. So um, stepping back, what I would like to do is begin with a list of problems. Um, and these problems pertain to the state of nature specifically, but are also broader problems having to do with Hobbes's theory. So the most basic problem is this. Hobbes says that the theory that he develops uh, of the social contract, his theory of civil society, is consistent with any type of government. And so his conception of sovereignty fits a democracy, it fits an aristocracy, and it fits a monarchy. But that he has a practical preference for monarchy because it is the uh, regime most suited to order. I don't want to interrogate this. This is a, the subject of another discussion. But let's just say that he's a self-proclaimed uh, fan of monarchy. Okay. Now, if you're a self-proclaimed fan of monarchy and your problem, the problem that you're trying to solve is to move from anarchy to monarchy, why would you not choose the path of least resistance a path that he actually employs in De Kiwe, which is to say that might makes right, that when a conqueror marches in, conquers a territory and a population, puts his sword to your neck, in his view and the way in which he portrays it, this constitutes a social contract. Why? Because if the conqueror walks away and doesn't take my life, this has created an obligation an implicit obligation that I have to follow whatever he commands subsequently. Why would you not choose that, but rather go for a social contract in which famously as depicted on the frontispiece of Leviathan, the body politic is composed of every individual that is a member of the Commonwealth. Okay. And uh, I think this is best captured by Sir Robert Filmer who in commenting on Leviathan said that he loved Hobbes's edifice, but mistrusted its foundation. Okay, so Filmer thinks that Hobbes is doing a great job in making a case for monarchy, but Filmer foresees that a case for monarchy built on the social contract has, uh, so to speak, a, a democratic virus in it that makes it vulnerable to democracy. So the question for me is, why would somebody not choose the path of least resistance, but rather go into this complicated, circuitous route in order to achieve this purpose, the circuitous route containing lots of dangers to the purpose that he's aspiring to? Okay, so that's question number one. Um, through Hobbes's writings and uh, with very good textual evidence, there have arisen over the years, over the centuries, certain uh, 
dominant interpretations of his political theory, which I want to place on the table. So the first of these is uh, notorious. It's his pursuit of a so-called civil science, um, that he's not simply looking to uh, put together a theory. He's not simply looking to uh, propose his opinions and provide reasons why we should adopt his opinions, but rather to create uh, the equivalent for politics of what the geometers have done for mathematics. There's very good reason to take this seriously. He says it a lot. He spends a lot of time doing mathematics. Um, and if um, one were to challenge the notion that uh, a serious person could be thinking of uh, putting together a geometry of politics, so to speak, uh, the response to that might be uh, Hobbes is, after all, the person who claimed that he had squared the circle. Uh, and so nothing should be surprising uh, in that regard. Uh, nevertheless, I want to flag it because there are certain problems with that prima facie claim. The prima facie claim being that he's trying to construct a geometrical politics, so to speak. In addition to his... Uh, various claims to that effect, that he wishes to sort of tear down everything that's been written about politics and begin from a firm foundation and establish his edifice in the way that the geometers have done that. There's a notorious story from Aubrey's Life of Hobbes that describes uh, an experience in which Hobbes, probably not for the first time, uh, but uh, probably for the first time paying serious attention, followed uh, Euclid's demonstration of a theorem um, and the the Aubrey's description is, is colorful so Hobbes is looking at this open book and he follows the the demonstration and then he reaches the conclusion and then he says by god there's no way that this is true and then he goes backwards and Aubrey's phrase is he becomes demonstratively convinced of the truth okay um so Alongside all of the claims about a geometrical politics, people take this anecdote to mark the beginning of his so-called scientific phase uh, in which he is truly devoted to this utopian idea that you could come up with a science of politics in which um, you can do what the geometers are doing. Um, the uh, so-called turn to science is part of another very prominent uh, way of interpreting Hobbes, which uh, begins most prominently, I think, with Strauss, uh, and then is adopted enthusiastically by Skinner, uh, and has it something like this, that Hobbes in the beginning is a, is a typical humanist. Um, that's problem number one for me, and I'll explain why in a moment, uh, that after the Aubrey incident, he enters his scientific phase, that the scientific phase in terms of political treatises includes the elements of law and the kiwi, and that uh, by the uh, end of the 1640s, he realizes that uh, you cannot succeed in this type of endeavor uh, by means of science alone, and therefore that you have to introduce uh, a certain measure of rhetoric, uh, which is what he claims to have done in Leviathan, which marks another shift, if you will, back to an acceptance of rhetoric uh, and a move away from pure science. Um, so why do I not like this story? Um, I don't like this story because um, it relies on uh, a, a dubious concept, the dubious concept being humanism. Uh, it's very widely accepted nowadays, uh, but um, when it comes to anything but surface descriptions, I don't know what people mean when they call somebody a humanist. So if humanist means you read ancient authors, then everyone uh, to this day who was educated in a sort of a basic Western model is a humanist. Um, so is Hobbes a typical humanist? Um, uh, Skinner took me to task for saying that uh, I don't understand what uh, what humanism means in, in Hobbes' uh, case. Uh, and he said that uh, he means by that the way in which Hobbes and his contemporaries would have understood the term. Well, problem number one is the term humanism did not exist in Hobbes's time. Problem number two is Hobbes is a very uncharacteristic humanist. Everybody else is reading Roman authors. Hobbes is reading Greek authors. He never wrote anything of any length uh, on a Roman author. Uh, 
And so uh, I, I therefore find the concept unhelpful in the sense that he's describing or people are describing when they're using this term, uh, a very broad movement, uh, but somebody who has an exceptional place in that very broad movement, even if we were to accept that he is a member of that movement. And there's a detailed case to be made for this, but uh, I'm not going to go into details now. I'm happy to revisit it if anybody is interested. The point being that his choices are unusual. Uh, so, for instance, writing on history and historians was considered uncharacteristic in the so-called humanist movement of the of the time. Writing on Thucydides was exceptionally uncharacteristic, and being someone who translates from the Greek into English uh, is just plain weird. Uh, now. What's very interesting is that uh, Hobbes's alleged reason for translating Thucydides was because he thinks that Thucydides uh, teaches, one, the dangers of demagoguery. And his second publication, as I mentioned earlier, is a precy of Aristotle's rhetoric. Now, interestingly for the story of Turns, um, this translation of Aristotle's rhetoric takes place during the so-called scientific phase. So for me, this raises another question, which is why is a scientist who has been converted to Euclid and is in search of a geometrical politics interested in Aristotle's rhetoric? Another problem has to do with Hobbes's understanding of the difference between philosophy and history. And I'll be very brief here, uh, even though this is a very thorny issue, but Hobbes understands essentially philosophy as uh, infallible reasoning, correct, true reasoning. And history is something very different because history relies on experience. And notoriously, there's a famous phrase in uh, Leviathan, uh, which captures his uh, thinking on this issue quite well, uh, experience concludeth nothing universally, right? So this, the sun rises every morning. Well, that's not true. The sun has risen every morning, but we don't know that that's going to happen tomorrow. And therefore, it's it wouldn't constitute philosophy to say that I expect the sun to rise tomorrow. It would constitute some sort of prudential claim on the basis of experience, okay? Now, at the very end of this debate about the relationship between philosophy and history lie very thorny questions because you would have to ask yourself questions about the relationship between accumulated experience and the point at which accumulated experience becomes the basis of reasoning on which philosophy is based. I don't want to go there right now. I don't think I would be able to resolve it, but you get some sense, I think, of how this is not a simple question of simply juxtaposing two fields that are independent of one another um, because philosophy depends on human experience for human beings. Uh, maybe for other beings it doesn't, but for human beings it does. And Hobbes is very well aware of this. Now, I'll just mention one thing which I think is relevant to our present purpose, which is that Hobbes begins to mix his own language about philosophy and experience when it comes to things like politics and the state of nature. So, for example, he says that People who are wise in the science, quote unquote, of politics are the kinds of people who have what the Romans used to call sapientia. Okay, so this is wisdom, and wisdom is not the same thing as science. They're related, but they're not the same thing. And so it's very clear that he's presented this dichotomy between philosophy and history as two distinct things, right? But he's violating the purported distinction. So if we are on the side of philosophy, we shouldn't be reaching to the side of history, but it turns out that you can't avoid this. And this becomes clear as he goes through his writings. And this is related to another problem, um, which is the problem of precision. So having declared as his goal to begin by demolishing everything that's in place and reestablishing everything on firm foundations, which means redefining every term and those who have read Leviathan from the beginning know that this is a quite painful exercise at times, sometimes very amusing, uh, but it involves the redefinition of things that you would have thought that you knew very well. But here's another side to, you know, let's say laughter. Uh, 
uh did you know that people laugh because you're doing something ridiculous and you're you're tickling their vain glory um and so he's engaging in that type of exercise um but even as he praises precision and chastises anybody who violates precision he himself is not sticking to that precision and so if you if you wanted to catch him in the act of violating his own precision uh you need a lot of notebooks uh, so it happens quite frequently, and of course, this raises a, a number of questions as well. More specifically, with regard to the state of nature, if you were to take a very simple, basic list of statements that he makes about the state of nature, you would see that they are mutually contradictory and in some cases exclusive. Um, so the state of nature is a historical condition, but it was not a historical condition. It is a conjecture, uh, an inference made from the passions, um, but it is also confirmed by daily experience. It has never existed uh, for everyone over all the world, yet every person's behavior is going to show you that it does exist. Um, it is the condition among sovereigns, but it is also the condition among individuals. There were groups in the state of nature. There were no groups in the state of nature. There was language in the state of nature. There is no language in the state of nature. There was artifice in the state of nature. There is no artifice in the state of nature. The state of nature and civil society are simply juxtaposed, right? So long story short, what we see from the beginning of his political treatises, most clearly, strangely uh, manifested in the elements of law is the erection of two uh, opposites, two opposite sides, and below each of the opposite sides is a series of other things, each of which is opposed to something on the other side. Okay, so he, he draws a distinction in the elements of law between the world of the mathematicians and the dogmatists, and under those two headings, he classifies everything in the world. So he says that everything good that exists in the world is the product of the mathematicians, Everything bad in the world is the product of the disputes between the dogmatists. He gives examples that to those who are interested in the state of nature will sound very familiar. So uh, lack of civilization, barbarity, savagery, absence of um, industry and art and so on and so forth are on the side of the dogmatists. Why? Because it's a, it's a state of war. It's a state of disagreement. Uh, agreement, complete agreement, is on the state uh, of the mathematicians, which has created a world in which we have everything that we are thankful for, so dentistry and cranes and, uh, you know, building materials and all of these other things are the product of mathematics. Now, let's just pause for a second and consider the fact that the, his portrayal of these two worlds is ridiculous, okay? Even if you agreed with him about the existence of a world of the mathematicians and the world of the dogmatists, his portrayal of the world of mathematics is ridiculous based on his own experience in which his world of mathematicians was filled with conflict. His, his controversies with mathematicians are notorious, um, not least with Descartes uh, and, and various other contemporaries. So the notion that uh, mathematicians simply deal in precepts, never invoke rhetoric, uh, always agree with one another because they are simply dealing in the truth uh, is not an accurate reflection of what goes on in the world of mathematics. The opposite portrayal, the world of the dogmatists, which includes presumably anyone who's not doing mathematics, is also inaccurate because there's a lot of agreement in a lot of fields that are based on, let's call it prudence or opinion or experience and so on, okay, just as there is a lot of disagreement. Now, nonetheless, the existence of this facade of a simple division between good and evil, order and disorder, and so on and so forth, is very useful because it gives us a clue to his ultimate method. And I only use the word ultimate because what I'm describing is a method that is sharpened and, and is made more efficient on the basis of uh, feedback, right? I mentioned that uh, version one of the Kiwi is bare 
version two of Dekiwe contains what he calls stumbling blocks. So presumably a lot of people wrote to him or came in, in discussions and said, wait a second, you said blah, blah, blah. And he says, oh, this is what I meant. Or um, to answer the objection that was raised, here's my response. So um, it's clear that he's listening and amending in accordance with what he's hearing from people. And there's other evidence besides. So I'm not simply basing this on the key this, there's a lot of evidence to, to support the notion that he's putting stuff out there. He's listening to what people are saying and he's taking that into account. He tells us, for example, explicitly in the beginning, in the preface to the reader of his edition of Thucydides, that that's what he did with his translation of Thucydides. He gave it to a number of prominent experts in the English language, in history, in literature, and so on. And they came back and said, Here, here's what we think. And presumably he made some changes. So when I say ultimate, I don't mean, I'm not contradicting myself in saying that he's consistent. He's consistent, but he's also listening to what people are saying. And why does this matter? Because what I'm ultimately pointing towards is something like a science of rhetoric. Okay, and I'm going to use the the term science of rhetoric because the real term I should be using uh, or we would be using if we were speaking of a contemporary of ours would be something like psychology, uh, but the term is not available at the time. So um, I want to be clear that when I'm suggesting that Hobbes is using a rhetoric of science, I am not saying that uh, it is all a facade with uh, scientific window dressing, so to speak, uh, intended to fool people into buying a certain story which has absolutely no basis in anything objective. Rather, what I'm saying is that it's a different kind of science. And that science is something like a psychology. And again, we don't have the time to to say why this is a, a reasonable interpretation, but he had declared his aspiration to write something like a psychological treatise before the elements of law uh, to Peyton. And we know that the elements of law um, is appears to be a first attempt at that sort of treatise, right? So uh, if if it were one of my colleagues today, especially my colleagues who work in American politics, they would call this political psychology. Uh, but it's a very good description of the basic idea of what is going on in the elements of law. And so the listening to the readers and incorporating their feedback is an integral part of this political psychology. Why? Because it's aimed at persuasion, right? And his goal from the very beginning was extremely ambitious. It wasn't simply to create order out of disorder. It was also to persuade everyone of the benefits of order and disorder. And again, I'm not going to be belabor this point, but I'll just say that if you ask yourself, what would it take to persuade everyone of something, you would realize that it's a pretty tall order, okay? Uh, especially if you understand and appreciate in the way that he does that uh, people have different dispositions, their circumstances affect the way in which they perceive the world. Uh, there's all sorts of other factors that make us think differently about different things, even though our basic nature might be similar. Uh, and therefore, that the, the expectation that the same basic argument would appeal to everyone is naive. Uh, and so then you have to ask yourself, how could you do this, right? And think here about less controversial issues than, than politics, order, and disorder. Think about basic scientific propositions and the degree to which those are accepted by everyone, right? You would run into problems of nomenclature and vocabulary and lingo. Um, you would run into problems that are conceptual. You would run into limitations. Some people can understand certain things. Some people cannot understand certain things. Then you would run into questions of interest. If something is opposing my interest, I am less likely to accept it and so on and so forth. So the problems are infinite, right? And if you ask yourself, a person who has studied Aristotle's rhetoric closely enough to have translated it from the Greek, how, how well aware is, a, is this person of these problems? 
um, how well aware is, the, is, a, is a, a, the same person of the problems inherent in demagoguery when he's identified this as the key issue in Thucydides' history, then I think that it's pretty clear that this is somebody who's paying attention to precisely that phenomenon and that that's part of what he's trying to do. So to go back for a moment to the question of the science, in my view, it would be strange if Hobbes made observations about the way in which we understand things and are persuaded about things and did not employ those observations in his own method, right? That would be strange. And so it is scientific insofar as it purports to have discovered something about the way in which we process information and are persuaded by arguments. It puts that science to work in an attempt to persuade of the benefits of order and the perils of disorder, in particular, the perils of disorder. And the state of nature happens to be the best piece of evidence of the fact that this is going on. Why? Because it has persuaded so many people and it has stuck in the minds of so many people even people who have absolutely no interest in the intricacies of the social contract and the difference of the Hobbesian social contract from the Lockean social contract from the Rousseauian social contract and so on, right? Think of how many people you've come across who recognize solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Uh, some of them might not even be able to tell you who the author is, uh, but somehow the, the, the phrase is familiar. Uh, and so something from a psychological perspective, from the perspective of persuasion, from the perspective of marketing, so to speak, uh, has been very successful. And I think that that success is the culmination of uh, attempts to sharpen what I described earlier as uh, an attempt to replace the sumum bonum with a sumum malum. Now, um, the sumum malum itself is based on a simple observation. So I remember vividly um, sitting in a, in a seminar on Hobbes uh, when I was younger, and um, a prominent Hobbes scholar uh, who actually is extremely insightful on Hobbes said uh, that uh, made some connection between Hobbes and liberalism. And I thought my first reaction was, this is preposterous. But I realize that not only is it not preposterous, of course, this is the, the basis of Filmer's observation, uh, but that Hobbes has provided, has done liberalism a great favor. And what is that favor? By choosing to go the circuitous path that I was describing in the beginning, rather than the direct path of simply saying that the mightiest has conquered and is therefore now de facto the sovereign. He has incorporated everyone into the political process. So very briefly, I want to highlight some of the elements of that incorporation just to show you how revolutionary a move that is and how much it involves the psychology that I'm talking about. The first reason why this is revolutionary is because it's preposterous, because what it claims for individuals is that individuals like you and me authorized the actions of the sovereign. Okay. Uh, I don't know what your daily experience is like, but if it's anything like mine, you know that you haven't authorized anything, whether you voted or not. Uh, there's no authorization. Okay, and there certainly was no authorization for any subject of Charles I or James II. So what exactly does it mean to have authorized? And why is he interested in my authorization? And the simple answer is that he is insightful enough to realize that the surrounding forces that are unfolding in not just English society, but European society at the time, make it inevitable that sooner or later, the same people who have been told that scripture and faith are sufficient for you to communicate with God and that you need no intervening authorities, 
the same forces that had begun what we now describe crudely as the scientific revolution would sooner or later lead to the inevitable question of if I can handle the salvation of my soul on my own, and if I can challenge the scientific claims made by different authorities, why can I not do the same for politics? And then the question is, if you realize that that's coming, how do you deal with it? And the answer for me is that you try to enlist these individuals to the cause rather than suppress them, because you realize that suppression is not going to work. And so the enlistment is a caressing, if you will, a flattering of their vainglory. Another scientific observation that we are motivated by vainglory, and he's got a fantastic account of this in chapter 13 of Leviathan. Uh, people dismiss it as tongue-in-cheek, but this section on mental equality is actually a fabulous description of human psychology, okay? So he's flattering the reader by saying, I will let you, individual reader, decide the validity of my claims in what essentially is a private encounter between Hobbes and you, so you can admit to yourself things that you wouldn't admit necessarily in public. And then you will walk away from this encounter as the author of the sovereign's actions. That's a pretty good deal, okay? You went from a nobody to superior to the sovereign because you have authorized the sovereign's actions and the sovereign is acting on your behalf. Now, I want to be clear. Again, this is not simply uh, BS. Why? Because there is a way in which each one of us authorizes the actions of the sovereign, and that is by staying home and not rebelling when we disagree with a certain policy of the sovereigns. Okay, so it's a negative upholding of the social contract. You never participated in an, in an initial agreement, but you participate in it daily by accepting the conditions that you find yourself in. Okay, so the tacit component of the social contract is the way in which you're stamping it with your approval every single day. And if you're speaking to somebody who's concerned about people grabbing their pitchforks and hitting the streets, this is an important appeal. And if it succeeds, you've done your, you've, you've, you've made progress towards order and away from disorder. So um, why will a sumum bonum not work? Well, because he says, if you survey the history of philosophy, you're going to see that it's a series of attempts to impose a sumum bonum in which my sumum bonum is supposedly better than yours. But what you realize is if you take a step back, there is no sumum bonum. Okay, and this for good reasons, not because he's a relativist, as some people have concluded, but because he gives very good objective reasons as to why there's disagreement about a sumum bonum, even within any individual's mind, let alone between individuals, right? Um, so I, it used to be that, uh, uh, students would doubt, uh, his assertion that you can never have enough and be satisfied. And one of the reasons why I'm grateful for COVID is because it put that notion to rest with the quest for toilet paper. Uh, tell me how much toilet paper is enough. Uh, and of course there's no amount of toilet paper that was enough for people during COVID. So that's what he means when he says that even for you, even if you are a very self-aware individual with very clear goals, there is no such thing as a sumum bonum or a finis ultimus because you will constantly be concerned about your future and you just don't know what your future holds. Okay, so what he proposes to do is take a step back. And this is where the connection with liberalism comes in. It's to find a space in which we agree that something interferes with our individual conceptions of the good. Okay, so if there is something, uh, Chris may want a car and Stephanie may want a book and I may want a cake. If we take a step back and find a space at which we identify something that is preventing each of us from getting what we want, that could be the basis of agreement. And that's where the state of nature comes in because he makes a claim in Tekiwe, which is that the fear of violent death is the supreme evil in nature. 
and I'm emphasizing the terms in nature, okay? Because some people have said, how can he be so naive? He's writing in an epoch of lots of religious martyrs and so on and so forth. Of course, he's not naive. What he's saying is that left alone, without someone whispering in your ear that in the afterlife, you will be rewarded for such and such an action in this life and so on and so forth, people are afraid of violent death. That's the claim, right? So the problem is because so many people will give you reasons to not be afraid of violent death and will try to manipulate you into thinking that it is not the thing that Hobbes tells you it is, you need to approach that sense of uncertainty and fear in a different way. And so the way in which he does this is by trying to build as wide a net of the potential for sumum malum as he can by paying attention to the requirements that he notes in Aristotle's rhetoric so that Hobbes means by rhetoric not any any of the fancy things that uh, 20th century commentators uh, claim rhetoric means but simply what Hobbes thinks it means which is whatever it takes to win persuasion in the hearer So this means that what he will need to persuade you of the benefits of order and the perils of disorder is something that is possible, something that is probable, and something that is memorable. So my basic understanding of the state of nature as it evolves through the works is that it is an attempt to make his conception of the state of nature possible, but also relevant, in other words, probable. So if, for example, you limited your conception of the state of nature to the state of the Indians of America, which he uses repeatedly to describe what a situation of uncertainty looks like, well, to most of his contemporary readers, the prospect of facing the Indians of America in that peril is rather uh, slim. And so you have to ask yourself, how far can this take you? And then you see that one of the changes is the introduction of the specter of civil war, which, of course, is a much more widespread uh, experience among his continental readers, whether English or otherwise. So what he's trying to do is uh, through the state of nature is something that he does in other versions of his work. I'll just mention the two most notable examples. One is right after his uh, exposition of the laws of nature in all their details, he says that, well, if you can't remember everything I've been seeing for the last 40 pages, uh, just use the golden rule. Uh, and that's a good enough summary uh, of what I mean by these various laws of nature. Um, it is the same thing that he does, of course, in the second half of Leviathan when it comes to what is the necessary article of faith. Uh, which is Jesus is the Christ. Uh, so an idea that all Christians can coalesce around without getting into the various details that divide them. So let me just end by um, pointing out a phrase that Hobbes uses, which uh, originates in uh, Protagoras. Um, so he... Uh, he, Hobbes, says that uh, human beings tend to judge others according to themselves. And um, the significance of this is evident as he goes through his account of human psychology and how my various organs of perception are the ways in which I take in the world and process it through my experiences and my disposition and my situation and so on, and then come up with an interpretation that is conducive to what I take to be in my benefit. If that is a universalizable psychological account, then this has to inform how he understands not simply political actors, but also his readers. And so, the way in which the multifaceted state of nature that evolves throughout his works is inconsistent 
if you were to be a stickler for detail and say, well, you said this right here, but you're saying something that is not quite consistent over here, and I'm taking these two things and I'm putting them side by side and I'm seeing that they don't fully accord. Um, but that's not exactly what he's doing. What he's doing is he's trying to create this antithesis between these two extremes, manipulate its existence, but in the background, he's sort of diving from the one to the other, which maybe the last thing I'll say about this is it ultimately tells you that we're looking at uh, what several scholars have, have, have said about the state of nature, which I agree with, which is that it's really a continuum and uh, that you never, you're never rid of it. Uh, so in the, in the most perfect civil society, you require its existence, if only as uh, a specter of what should keep you in that perfect civil society. Um, and of course, at the other end of the spectrum, you have this uh, uh, full sense that you're living, if you've experienced, for example, civil war, of what it would be like to be completely devoid of any kind of authority. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, that's an incredibly rich paper. I think I've got about six or seven questions. Now I've got to decide what uh, order I want to ask me. Um, Thank you. Uh, can, can I suggest that if anyone has a question, if you could just write a line, a very short version of it in the chat, and then I'll be able to call on people in the order in which those are asked in the chat. And just while people are, are composing their questions, I might jump in and use my chair's privilege to, to ask the first one, uh, if I could. Um, it's a, I suppose it's a slightly provocative question, but I'm, I'm not, not being provocative about your ideas, really about Hobbes's position in relation to, to liberalism in the way that you were describing it towards the end of the paper. Um, and, and I was really struck by the sense of the summum malum as what draws society together rather than the summum bonum and that people can want extremely different things and yet still cohere in a society because of the summum malum. That's an incredibly powerful idea and really incisive. And I just wondered to what extent you think that tips over necessarily into something like the logic of the scapegoat. So we, we identify the evil other that we need to expel outside the polis. And it, it, is that, as far as Hobbes is concerned, would you say, is that the fundamental logic, if not of liberalism as a whole, of a certain Hobbesian liberalism, this scapegoat logic, in order to find that which is supremely evil, in order that in opposition to that, we might cohere as a society, because it seems that that's the function the state of nature is playing for him. Yeah, I think I think that's exactly right. Um, and I, I would say that the the key difference here is um, let's let's call it uh, insincerity. Uh, so the the key difference is that Hobbes tells you that that's what's going on and liberalism prefers not to. Uh, but but I'll give you some examples. Um, there's a, a phrase in uh, chapter one in De Kiwe where he's describing the state of nature. And uh, it's one of the many problematic passages because he seems to say, this is before, of course, the solitary poor, nasty, brutish, and short. And he seems to be describing groups, warring groups in the state of nature. And he says that you measure who you are by the difference from the enemy. Okay, so... You have two opposing forces, and it's the difference in numbers that determines the outcome, let's say crudely, okay? So it is it is def a defining characteristic, right? And then ask yourself, what do you do when you form a group, right? We tend to focus on the positive aspects of forming a group. But when you're forming a group, the implicit statement that you're making by forming a group is that you're different from everyone who's not a member of the group. I don't care what the group is. Okay, so it's not a, a judgment on groups. It's simply the logic of group formation. Right? Um, now, where liberalism is concerned, you might say that there are sort of old school liberals who would find this completely um, in accordance with their core beliefs. Um, so for instance, the uh, idea that uh, a key tenet of liberalism is the protection of individual rights. 
this has already conjured that someone is out there trying to violate someone else's rights and that what we need to do is to protect those rights. And so I think that the difference is one of presentation and, you know, there's another sort of you could you could uh, launch a, a huge discussion on the significance of Hobbes's reception. And there's there's very good work on this uh, by several people, but. John Parkin in particular, um, the the way in which the reception actually then colors what people think of the theory, right? So that the, the reception of the person and the perception of what the theory is saying become an inescapable part of how people then read the work, especially a work that's been read over 400 years. Uh, you see something similar in Machiavelli. So people have started to change their tune about Machiavelli in various ways. But it's very clear that what people thought of Machiavelli, what people thought about the things that people said about Machiavelli and so on, have become entangled with one's attempt to read the text and understand what the text says, and that this colors our interpretation. And it's very clear that this has happened with Hobbes as well. So there's a park in documents, the the, the various terms of abuse that were attached to to Hobbes, the monster of Malmesbury and so on and so forth, and that he's he he portrays human beings as evil and and all of these different things, which many times don't even have any basis in the text, but are simply the products of some attempted at interpretation, maybe even some attempt at a polemic, a contemporary polemic that then acquires its own life, right? So I think that there's a fundamental agreement there about the logic of group formation between Hobbes and liberalism insofar as the here's what the group is doing and here's what outsiders are doing uh, and then of course you're asking the right question which is what is the logical consequence of this train of thought uh, and does it lead to something like xenophobia or scapegoating even internally Right. And that happens to be a topic that Machiavelli tackles more explicitly than Hobbes does, but but th that they seem to be in agreement about. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I I wonder if I could ask um, a second question, which is a, a very general one um, that relates to something you said very early in the paper, which, you know, obviously there's a lot of uncertainty about what the state of nature means, you know in Hobbes, let alone more broadly, and, and you know, one could catalogue any number of different ways in which the term has been used. Um, it put me in mind of something Mark Somos says in, in American States of Nature, um, that, that he would put the state of nature alongside freedom and equality as fundamental um, core modern ideas. Um, and it, that quotation's always resonated. Now, I'm still not completely sure what I think about it, but I, I, I'm tempted to agree. And I'm wondering if one of the reasons that it is so central is that it is so wonderfully plastic. You know, freedom, you know, uh, George Lakoff and others have, have written on the plasticity of the notion of freedom, how it means very different things to different people, all grouped on, you know, Isaiah Berlin, obviously. Um, and, and equality as well has many different meanings and can be deployed in, in many different ideological frames. Um, so I, I guess I'm asking, do you, do you agree with, with what Mark is saying? In, to what extent do you agree with what Mark is saying in that book? And, and what would be our own reflections on why the state of nature is such a, a central and fundamental idea? Because as you say, it is, it is quite quirky in many ways and, and bizarre as well. Yes. Um, so I I agree with Mark. Uh, I I'm not prepared to say how far I want to uh, to to equate whether I want to equate it with freedom and equality. But I agree with Mark, not least because it is so um, closely tied to the notion of freedom and equality, and it does so much work for the notion of freedom and equality, at least in its modern conception. Um, it is obviously uh, not as pithy as freedom and equality, uh, and it is a little too cryptic for, for many people. But 
you could say that um, if you didn't, uh, if you weren't held back so much by the precise term, and you focused more on the type of tool that it is and the kind of function that it performs, then obviously uh, it is a very widespread phenomenon. And you know, nowadays, as much as any other time, people keep talking about uh, boogeymen and uh, you know, sort of. Uh, uh, the different rhetorical approaches or tools that are intended to elicit a certain kind of political response, right? And people always present it as a sign of contemporary moral decay. But if you look at the history of political thought, I don't know that you can find any period in which this isn't happening in one form or another. And so um, I think that it is crucial. Um, and I think that it does... Uh, it does play this crucial role precisely because of what you describe very aptly as its plasticity. So, um, and, and let me, let me insert a comment here, um, about something that I forgot to, uh, address, which is that there's a key component to what I called his science of rhetoric, um, which is that he understands that terms are plastic even as he tells us that it's possible to define a term in very precise terms and then try to keep the conversation very much constrained by that precision, okay? He's, in other words, he will tell us, this is how I want you to understand freedom. But he's also very well aware that your mind is playing games with the term freedom and you're roaming and ranging freely and doing all kinds of things which he can take advantage of, okay? And why, why am I saying this? I'm not making this up. He says explicitly that people are manipulating you by uttering the word freedom, okay? Because in a very basic sense, the mind has a positive and a negative reaction to terms of approbation and disapprobation, okay? So when I said earlier that the term rhetoric, for instance, yes, of course, has a technical meaning, which goes back to the manuals of rhetoric of the 16th century and the ancients and so on and so forth. But also, and most importantly, it has a very general meaning, which is that it is a term of disapprobation. When you call someone's utter, uh, utterings uh, rhetoric, what you're saying is that this person is being political, if you're being polite, uh, or that this person is making things up, or that this person has is trying to sell you a bill of goods or that um there there's some sort of self-interest motivating what they're saying right but that it's not the truth and so the um the the idea that he's simply sticking to uh one conception of these basic terms uh is simply not borne out by the evidence uh he's very well aware of the fact that the terms are plastic and that he can manipulate this plasticity because just as someone says the word freedom and you're thinking if it's accompanied by the word freedom, it must be good. Um, he knows that he can do the same thing with other terms and of course, state of nature and it's, 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 uh, attendant dangers or insecurity are one of the, the, these, these, these types of maneuvers. Well, thank you ever so much. That's uh, really, really helpful. Um, I think Stephanie has a question. Thank you so much for the really interesting talk. Um, my question is uh, sort of trying to also figure out um, all the interest that interesting ideas in my own head. Um, so I was really interested in when you were talking about the difference between Hobbes's um, valuing of philosophical engagement versus uh, the historical engagement in terms of the idea of correct reasoning versus more experience based um, sort of um, framework. And I was wondering if I was trying to relate this idea to the ideal citizen in what Hobbes might view that um, individual as. Um, I was wondering if in Hobbes's um, view, the ideal citizen might be um, an agent who engages in this philosophical reasoning. And if this would be the case, ideally, um, would this citizen arrive at the view um, that Hobbes is trying to advance in his works that um, of the value of order versus anarchy? Um, and I was wondering if you you believe that Hobbes is 
has a view of individuals insofar as that they're not tended towards this reasoning, they're more tended towards experience-based reasoning. And this is why he tries to appeal to a different consideration um, of the, the fear of death, which is um, sort of, and it, it's not that one has experience of it in their life, but they're always keenly aware of it throughout their life experience. Um, and if I was wondering that, is this the reason that he uses this rhetoric versus um, sort of philosophical arg argumentation? And is this um, based on his view of um, individuals? And I was wondering if you think that he is trying to tend to this, um, this nature of individuals. And if it weren't the case, would he have written these works differently? Or, or would he have needed to write them at all? Um, I know he's got a, a sort of a paragraph where he says, you know, bees are just naturally, they cooperate so well. Um, so I was just wondering your views on that. Thank you. That's that's a great question. So um, so your your instinct is exactly right, I think. Um, so a couple of things. What is his expectation of the audience? Um, he's quite explicit about this in a number of places. I list some of them uh, in the book. Um, he knows, for example, that setting aside, um, let's say, differences in intelligence, um, he knows that differences in experience make for very different uh, receptors, okay? So members of the audience. He's very much aware uh, and clearly concerned because he mentions it a number of times about the fact that most people are just too busy to think about these things. Okay, so he he very uh, eloquently describes the daily life of someone who has to worry about work, sustenance, and all the basic needs, and the uh, likelihood that that individual is going to sit down and say, let me think about the philosophical origins of civil society. Okay, so the simplest answer is, he knows very well that he's dealing with a very broad range in the audience, okay? And by the way, because here one could say, what audience are you talking about? Because if you're talking about readers, these readers would be educated, relatively wealthy, because you have to afford a copy of Leviathan or Dickie Wayne, and so on and so forth. Yes, but he's also very well aware of the way in which information travels, because he famously says that all he needs to do is influence the mind of a thousand gentlemen, and then these ideas are going to filter through society in different ways, right? The most obvious of which is uh, a preacher is aware of, of a certain idea and then speaks about it on the pulpit, and then an audience of people who have not read the work somehow receives a, a distilled version of it, right? So he knows that he's not simply speaking to readers, um, he's not simply speaking to educated readers. He's speaking to a much broader audience with very different attention spans uh, for intellectual, physiological, but also practical reasons, right? I'm just too concerned with making a living, okay? So this, I'm not spending time thinking about the philosophy of this. Um, and he knows that we have certain characteristics so I really think that this idea that uh, Gabriella Slump has written about, um, you know, a lot of people notice it, but but not enough people pay enough attention to it, which is the significance of vainglory in his account. Uh, because people, there was a dominant uh, mode of interpretation uh, for a time that affixed it to the nobility. So there was a very simple narrative that basically said, you know, it's the nobility that are agitating and there's a certain brand of nobleman who is so ambitious that he wants to take over from the king and that's the real problem. Okay, yes, that is a problem, but that's not the big problem. The big problem is that every single person thinks that they're wiser than every other person. Okay, and I'll tell you why he's right. Think of any discussion that you've had in your life with someone on a moral issue. Does anyone sound deferential in saying, you know, I'm willing to let the experts speak on this issue and so on? No, the, the vehemence with which we speak when we when we pontificate on these issues is just unbelievable, right? And so that's why I'm saying that that second uh, 
criterion of equality, the mental equality in chapter 13 is crucial because there what he says is the reason why people are equal is because they all think they're the best. But the best at what? He says explicitly, there's a better biologist and a worse biologist. There's no question about that. Why? Because someone has spent 30 years studying biology and somebody has never studied biology. So of course, there's a difference in that regard. So he's not talking about that. What he's talking about is judgments of wrong and right. And in judgments of wrong and right, to use his phrase, every Tom, Dick, and Harry has an opinion about something. But he draws a distinction again between every Tom, Dick, and Harry and, let's say, Archimedes' discovery of a certain geometrical principle, the relationship of a sphere to a cylinder. Just because Archimedes did it and just because it's possible for a mind to do it, it certainly, I can tell you this for a fact, doesn't mean that I could do it. Okay? And so he's very well aware of these differences and now this gets me to a component of your your question which is i think is crucial is now what right so now there has to be a philosophical argument there have to be supplements to the philosophical argument that are let's say you know we could call them rhetorical or we could call them psychological but devices intended to graft something onto your mind to say that not only have I persuaded you? Let's say you managed to read through the 17 laws of nature. Now you need to remember them. Okay. And not only do you need to remember them for your final exam, you need to remember them every time you're faced with a moral challenge, which is why he says, just remember the golden rule. Okay. Same thing goes on with the fear of violent death in the state of nature, in my view. So what is he doing? He's essentially saying, Here's a Venn diagram of things. And in the middle of this Venn diagram, there is the uncertainty of anarchy. That's enough, right? And some of it is captured by the condition of the Indian tribes of America, and some of it is captured by civil wars all over Europe, and some of it by international relations, and some of it by the fact that you lock your bike because you don't want to, people to steal it, and so on and so forth. But the gist of it is, that there's reason for you to be diffident, right? Unless there's someone specifically watching your stuff. But even if there were someone watching your stuff, you'd be diffident because you, that, that person might steal it. So it's how do you get this point across, but not simply as a philosophical principle, not as an elaborate concept. That's good, right? And some people need that. But also, how do you make it memorable such that every person who is going to be tempted to go pick up a pitchfork and hit the streets will say, bad idea, right? And he's got a very colorful uh, description of this in the, the end to the preface to the readers in Dekiwe, where he says, don't let people fool you into pursuing freedom, quote unquote so that they can wade through your blood on their way to power, right? So last thing I wanna say about uh, the, the issue that you raised is this of course has great consequences for civic education, what we could call how the, you know, how the Commonwealth handles all of these individuals, which is why he frequently invokes the need for the sovereign to control dogma. And by this, we don't just mean theology, but of course, theology is the key issue here, right? But more broadly, uh, if you recall in Leviathan, there's a discussion of teaching even through church civic duty, the respect for parents, which is written in scripture and in the Ten Commandments, is also a way for you to remember that you should honor your king uh and so on and so forth right and that this type of civic education is crucial to forming the kind of individual that you would want as a citizen because that citizen needs to be active enough to believe that she is the author of the social contract but not so active as to threaten that social contract right so that's that means you've got to find some sweet spot where 
We are active, we're engaged, we're not passive, but we're not also rebellious. And that's why the uh, significance of the of the doctrine is so great. That's why he says, you know, I'm hoping that somebody's going to take this Leviathan and make it a manual for uh, how to educate people through the universities and then trickle down through these these thousand gentlemen uh, to the rest of the population. Um, and that's also why the state of nature, even in the best Commonwealth, will remain as a part of the doctrine, as a part of why it is that you're here. Because, you know, if things go really well, and they keep going really well, at some point, you're going to forget why it is that you're obeying the sovereign's commands. And someone's going to have to remind you in a way that is not detrimental to social order. Right. And so that's when the specter of the state of nature and the kinds of things that Chris was talking about earlier come in, because those are the kinds of reminders that tell you this is, uh, you know, what what uh, my social scientist friends call rally around the flag phenomena. Right. So war, external threats danger of uh, some you know some internal group trying to do nefarious things or or what have you because they are uh, what what Machiavelli used to call returning people to the psychology of the beginning of cities right the mindset that you're you're under siege or in danger and that tells you why we're in this together Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you Stephanie, so do, you, do you have any um, follow-up questions or comments um, to make? Um, oh, well, that was a really, um, really helpful answer. Answer. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, you. I think that it was, it was just really interesting that sort of it seems like that balance between um, internalizing the sort of the argument versus the bolstering of the um, or the flattery of the vainglory in terms of understanding the argument um internalizing it but then um sort of rallying around it so um no that that was really helpful thank you very much you're welcome wonderful i i have one further question um and i would encourage anyone who's present who hasn't yet asked a question do to feel free to do that. Uh, if, if there's something on your mind, it's likely to be on either the mind of someone else in this meeting or someone who's going to watch the video later. So, so please don't hold back. If you have a question, do please feel free. And while you're, you're thinking of what you might ask, I, I will, I will ask what will be my final question. Um, it's, it's a question about the extent to which Hobbes's geometric paradigm has loaded the dice for political theory since his day um and there's there's a sense in which the 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 way that we do politics takes still today i think it would be fair to say in many ways as as its unit the individual um and uh, people driven by a, a rational self interest and i think certainly the the first of those the second is much more problematic but the first of those I think fits very snugly indeed into Hobbes's geometric method. Um, and so, so the first part of my question is, to what extent do you think that this attempt to put political science on a geometric basis is still with us in the in the way that we do politics today? And, and this, the second somewhat related part of the question is a, a lot of the ways in which you were describing Hobbes seem to me to be characteristically Lucretian. Um, he, he seems to, to have a lot in common with the atomists, uh, a focus, for example, on order and chaos as the fundamental distinction. Um, again, the, the beginning with atoms, not, not with groups or dependencies, family relationships, but with essentially equal individuals. Um, now, if I remember, De Rerum Natura was rediscovered and translated in the, the 15th century, so it, it would have been available, although you were saying he was much more conversant with the, the Greek tradition than with the Roman. Um, do, do you know whether he was explicitly influenced by atomistic ideas or, or, or whether, if he wasn't, there is there are still very interesting resonances between what his approach and and the approach that, that's taken by someone like Lucretius? Um both great 
great questions. Um, so let me start with the second. Um, we we know that not only did he uh, would he have been familiar with sort of Lucretius in the in the air. Uh, in there's a catalog of the uh, Chatsworth Library of the Hardwick Library uh, in Hobbes's hand uh, from the late 1620s, uh, in which a copy of the Rerum Natura is listed. Um, number one. Number two, he uses the phrase de rerum natura in Latin in the elements of law. And so there's no question that that's a reference to Lucretius. Uh, that's the smoking gun, if you will. Um, the similarity was such that when Creech published his translation of Lucretius, the marketing claim in the in the I, it might be in the frontispiece or very early on in the introduction is uh fans of mr hobbs will see the similarity to to his state of nature okay so hobbs is the famous uh the state of nature is the famous concept in lucretius you should read lucretius if you're interested in the state of nature is was the pitch and so it's very clear that there's there's a connection there. Uh, people have written about uh, speculating about where it might have come from. So the there's an obvious uh, uh, possible source, which is uh, his time in Paris, because Gassendi and uh, various other atomists uh, were there, and we knew we know that he was converse, conversing with them and exchanging ideas and manuscripts and and so on. So there's no question that he was very familiar with whatever the state of the art uh, atomistic Lucretian uh, thought was. Um, and there are a lot of similarities. Um, I wrote a chapter, there's a chapter in the book on this. Um, as you know, there's, there's, you know, one of the striking similarities is the, the interest in uh, Thucydides, the fact that Lucretius closes the Dererum Natura with uh, the plague of Athens. Um, and so, uh, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that you should read the two side by side and that that they inform uh, that that rather Lucretius informs uh, or should inform one's understanding of Hobbes. Um, I also love the, the question about geometry and, and political science. So the term civil science uh, occurs in Hobbes' English only once. Um, and it occurs a number of times in uh, the Latin, uh, which is interesting because, of course, in the Latin, it means something a little bit different than what it does in the English. But all of this is taking place in a period of transition from scientia as uh, this nebulous concept that has something to do with systematic knowledge and so on to something closer to what we understand as science involving a specific method uh, certain things that are appropriate and inappropriate as you're trying to gather evidence and and uh classify the evidence and understand what its significance might be and what have you so that makes it tricky to say where exactly one should situate this however just as rhetoric is a term of disapprobation. Science is a term of, of approbation. And that's why I think that whatever else may be going on, and again, I want to be very clear about this. I'm not saying that there is no science. There's very much a science, except not the kind of science that he's claiming. Um, there is a science. It's a science, as I said, of rhetoric or what we might call psychology today. Um, and of course, a part of that science is the uh, understanding that when I say rhetoric, your brain says negative, And when I say science, your brain says positive. Uh, and if I ask you which side would you prefer to be aligned with, you would probably choose science all the time, uh, or most people would choose science all the time. Um, and so whatever else is going on, we know that there's this dimension. Now, that said, because of all of the time that he spends talking about 
the greatness of the geometers and the virtues of trying to imitate their method and so on. Um, it's completely understandable why people reading it would think this is in earnest. He's actually trying to do this, this mathematics. Um, he's got a phrase, which, which is interesting. Um, uh, and Tim Rayler and I have debated over this. He says that geometry is the only science that God has heretofore graced mankind with. And Tim thinks heretofore means there's another one coming. And I think it's the only one and we're not going to get another one. So, but it doesn't matter. The point is, it's that's indicative of how easy it is to, to move from one side to the other, right? To say that he really believes that there's a promise that there is going to be a geometrical science for politics, which will give us as good results in politics as we get in geometry. I think that's not the case. But setting that aside, um, it it definitely uh, plays a major role in the the long path from where he is to our political science. And so I want to stay for a moment with the gist of what I take your point to be. Um, it is a very important episode on the road to social science as it as it appears today um and it is to my mind uh it is a very apt and incisive um uh observation about how social science works because i don't need to tell you this uh much of social science is bs um there's good social science but there's a whole lot of bad social science. Uh, but the but there are certain trappings of science which, when attached to bad social science, make it harder for people to discern that it's bad social science. So, for example, uh, numbers have become the new opiate of the masses. If you have surveys and if you have uh, you know studies and experiments and these kinds of things. Uh, people think you're telling the truth. Doesn't matter that you're telling these, you're saying the exact opposite thing of what the previous person said, who did the exact same, used the exact same methods, and so on and so forth. Nobody reads the fine print, at least among the general public. People don't read the fine print that says the same 18 graduate students in psychology were paid $20 to participate in the study over two weeks, on the basis of which we concluded that you don't need as much sleep as people used to tell you that you needed, or what have you. Um, and this has become especially acute in political science because political science has tried to imitate the science portion of math of, of, of economics, excuse me. Um, and to the extent that economics has been successful in scientizing, if that's a word, it's 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 domain, uh, political science is finding it much harder to do so. And, uh, you know, let me just give you the most obvious example. On the simplest quantifiable tasks, the work of political science is a complete failure. So there's a complete inability, even in the United States, which has a very predictable electoral system, it's virtually impossible to find anybody who will tell you what the outcome of an election is going to be, a national election. OK, so the pollsters are almost always wrong. That should tell you something that we've made all this progress. We've we've sharpened our sense of what sorts of uh, focus groups are better, what sorts of samples are better, what mathematical statistical methods are better and so on and so forth. We're still incapable of doing something as basic as saying. This person is going to win uh, and here's how the electors uh, are going to shake out uh, from state to state. So um, I take that to be not, you know, one way to read this would be to say Hobbes's dream has failed. Like, let's say you agree with my diagnosis of social science, which of course many people disagree with. Um, even if you agreed, you could say this is just evidence that he was utopian and experience has proven him wrong. Right. So that's that's been a, a pie in the sky thing and it's it's never happened uh, and never will. 
I take it to be evidence of his success because if what he says about science is not what it appears to be, namely the false hope of a geometrical science and so on and so forth, but rather the knowledge of what talk of science and rhetoric does on a psychological political level, then it shows you that he's he's a very astute observer of uh, political actors. Um, and I think you're exactly right to focus on the individual as the, the role of the individual as the unit of analysis here, which you could say is a relatively modern phenomenon. You could say that uh, it, it begins in earnest in Machiavelli's Prince, and by Hobbes's time, it has become a little bit more obvious, uh, but, but that Hobbes really brings it to a completely different level because he goes into it in, in so much detail. But, but the idea that when you're a ruler or anyone who's considering uh, positions of power, you view the people not as a mass, but as a collection of individual minds whose thoughts actually matter in the political process, right? So it's it, there, there's a very simple political calculation which everyone from Machiavelli onwards, I think, is is uh, becomes increasingly aware of, um, and Hobbes is certainly one of them, which is that it's easier to do things by persuading people to do them than by coercing them. Uh, it's cheaper, it's less problematic, it's more stable. And so that means that you now have to ask yourself, what's the best way of doing this? And clearly, Machiavelli's big observation was it's the best way to do this is not to treat the people as a mass, the people as a blob, but as a series of individual brains who may have some of the same concerns that you do, albeit expressed differently because of where they're situated, but that those need to be taken into account as you think about how to recruit them to your purpose. Thank you so much. Um, I think the, um, the length and um, scope of that answer is, is indicative of the way that you've, you've so generously engaged uh, with the uh, uh, with the things that, that Stephanie and I have been throwing at you. And, and we're uh, very grateful indeed uh, for that. Um, just before I close, um, I, I would remind people um, that we are doing this again in a week uh, when we have Professor John Protevi, who will be talking about the state of nature and slavery. Um, so hop onto the uh, Social Contract Research Network website if you want the, the link uh, for that seminar. Uh, and all uh, that it remains for me to do then uh, is uh, very deeply, very sincerely, uh, to thank uh, Professor Ioannis Evigenis very much uh, indeed. Please join with me uh, in thanking our speaker, Professor Evigenis. Thank you.